die with a joyful heart in the knowledge of our infinite achievements and of a contribution unique in the history that bears my name. the Jews imagine, with the extermination of the Aryan people. Instead, it will see the complete annihilation of the Jews. I do not play at war. I shall not allow myself. That is my mission. Zachor Gedankt, in whatever language we must remember. My name is Frida Jaffe, or in another life I was known as Fredja Geltzman, born in uh, Piotrkov, Poland, which is central Poland, uh, very near Lodz. And that was, that was my beginning in Piotrkov, but then my parents and I, and later on a baby brother, lived in a small city called Lututov, also in Poland, about uh, maybe a hundred kilometers from the central Piotrkov Lodz area. Freja, how old were you when the Shoah began? I was born in 1937, so I was two years old at the outbreak of World War II. You tell us about your life before the Nazi invasion. Oh, I have some lovely photographs of me on outings with my parents when I was probably three years old. It must have been, maybe, maybe the war had already started, but just not gotten to Lutetov yet. Uh, always loved to be outdoors, always loved to be around flowers and uh, gardens. And At that point, as far as life with my parents, or don't remember the birth of my baby brother, that was, uh, that was later. Frasia, when the war touched your young life, what do you remember? My very, very young, as I call it, my so-called childhood really has to do with some pretty traumatic things that happened. The first huge, huge event that, that I, I do remember that it was in January of 1942. My father was publicly executed by hanging in Lututov and I very clearly remember the day that troops, I don't know whether they were uh, Nazi troops, German troops, uh, Ukrainian troops, or just the local police, but there were people in uniform who broke into our, our home and uh, literally dragged my father out of bed. He was ill. I really can't tell you 
the, the noise, the, the fright. Uh, my mother was in the process of, of curling my hair. I was sitting on a bench at the foot of my father's bed. And we were forced, along with the entire population of the town, to the town square to uh, witness an execution. Apparently there was a war crimes trial in Poland in the late 1970s or early 1980s had nothing to do with um, uh, Jews, Nazis, but it had to do with the Nazi regime against Poles and war crimes that were committed against Polish citizens during the occupation. I found out that one of the, uh, the people that was brought to this trial was the commandant of Lutetov, his name was uh, Dit Berner, and the Polish government was charging him with war crimes. And because of Dit Berner's activities during the, the occupation, something was brought up about the execution, and it is very much documented in a number of books, of one Joseph Gelsman. And the testimony that was given was, uh, one of them was that the personal enmities against Joseph Gelsman was that um, he refused to turn over. My father was a, uh, a master tanner. They had always been in the leather business, leather factories. And apparently he had, uh, from, from what someone in my family had told me, he, w he was a chemist. And he had created or, or uh, discovered a tanning process where he could take useless animal hides that prior to that had just been thrown away. Uh, and if we know anything about how much the Germans loved their leather, you know how important leather was for them, for their boots, for their belts, for their, their uniforms and all. The factory, all the Jewish businesses had been confiscated and turned over to German or Volksdeutsch, uh, Polish nationals. Nobody will forget the strength and the pride with, with which Joseph Gelsman was led to the gallows and that the only thing, and it's, it's in my testimony that I have, that the only thing that he asked of his citizens was to please take care of his wife and children. He didn't ask anything for himself. He was hanged, and to make the point even more clear to the citizenry, according again to the testimony of, of, of these people at that trial, his body was left hanging in the square for hours even after, long after the townspeople, including my mother and, and my little brother and I were told to go back to our residence, but he was left hanging there until two other uh, Jewish citizens finally went and cut him down. And he was buried. There was, at that time, there was a Jewish cemetery, either in Lutetov or very near there. And by the way, Rabbi, I have it on good testimony. I've had it researched. The place that was supposedly a Jewish cemetery then is a garbage dump used for disposing garbage in Lutetov today. Frasia, I understand after your father's death, your mother and you and your brother went to Pietrakov to join the family. Can you tell us about that? Um, I don't remember. I don't know what happened to us. Apparently my mother had help. There was no way that she could have gotten out of the Lutetov ghetto with a, an infant and a small child and somehow wanting to go back to be with her family, my grandparents, my uncle. There were a lot of relatives in Piotrkov, in the ghetto. But Piotrkov was a very large ghetto. It was the first documented ghetto in Poland. And somehow we, we did 
we did end up. So I have more, a, a bit more recollection about the ghetto in Piotrkov than I do in, in Lututov because the Lututov ghetto was not a closed, there weren't enough Jews to really have a closed ghetto in Lututov. It was just a couple of designated streets. So I don't know how she did it. Freja, could it possibly have been help that your mother received from the parish priest that enabled her to join the family and get to the ghetto in Pietrico? Yes, and that's the big, because our house was directly across from this very large, I call it a cathedral, it was really a big, big church. Still remember me. This is a photograph of me sitting just on some broken steps with my favorite person, you know, it just occurred to me uh, not long ago, I don't know anything about this handbag, this purse, but my father was in the leather business. And chances are pretty good that he made this handbag for me. But I clearly remember that I would never step out of the house without that purse and that little white dainty apron that I insisted I would not walk out the door. I remember that very clearly. So I'm sitting on this step, which is, it's really hard to see on this particular picture. It's a little bit easier here, is those were the steps of the parish house, which is where the priest lived. And the church this was our house right here. As popular and well-known and respected as apparently my father was, they still, the locals, even though now it's their uh, children and grandchildren that, that remember, they still refer to this, to the house, and it's still on her grid. They call it the Geltzmann house. When she was talking to the, the locals at, in the marketplace there, and, said if anybody had uh, distant relatives or uh, perhaps grandparents that did anyone remember Joseph Gelsman? And they said, Joseph Gelsman, that's the Gelsman house. And they still, they still refer to this particular building as that. And it has the, today, the, the notoriety of um, after the ghetto was, well, sort of terminated and uh, after the, the hangings, the um, um, the transport the little transports from that small town were to some of the concentration camps. I'm not sure which ones, but that became the Nazi headquarter in that town. Gelsman House became the central bureau, and then later, years later, it was the the communist um, headquarters. So. It's, even though it's been different buildings, it is still known as the Geltzmann House. And my researcher was uh, trying to be very clever in, in one of her correspondences. She said, oh, and the woman who owns that building now, it's for sale. It, though it needs a lot of work, Frida, you might be able to buy it. Frida, let's continue with your memories of life in the Pietrakov ghetto. How, do I, how does a five-year, by then I was four and a half, close to five years of age. It, it was a, a time of, about the only thing that I can honestly tell you is that all I can really remember is fear, hunger, pain, and just terror every day. There were things that were going on and of course, uh, I was, we were with my grandmother, my grandfather, there were several other aunts, sisters of my mother who were still living there. Um, I, I wrote an essay at one time, I, you might have heard it, it during Yom HaShoah many years ago, where I described the things that we were so afraid of and there were bombings and shootings and being being me, if I heard anything, I would run to the window, and the windows in the building were very big. It was a major, major street. Um, Pilsudskiego was just one of the main streets, and it turned out that it ended up being within the ghetto itself, but 
Because it was sort of a border street, we did not, my grandparents did not have to leave the apartment. Others were jammed into uh, some of the rooms and as they were brought in from some of the other ghettos. But we, we stayed there until that fateful week, that terrible week in October when all the deportations were. But I remember the fear, I remember just looking out the window and just seeing people were being beaten, people were being literally shot on the street. And in my essay, it, um, when we were very scared and, and very frightened with things that were going on outside that we heard of, we would all huddle, meaning whoever was uh, in, in the house or in the apartment, we would all huddle into a closet. But it really wasn't a closet at all because I remember in the back of the closet, somehow they would, my grandparents would push this wall aside and it was a small room. And during all those periods, um, a child will play. A child will find things to play with, even if it is just their own clothing. But in moments of stress, it, you just, they need to play. Unfortunately, I had to learn to play very silent games. And one of the silent games had to be to shh. You can't talk, you can't laugh, you can't cry. You can't be heard while we're in this gathering place. I don't even remember for, for during those times the luxury of laughing or crying. I apparently had the reputation in the Piotrkov ghetto of, um, as I tell some students when I speak to them, <laughs> they think that Harry Potter uh, had the first invisibility cloak, but I tell the students that they're wrong, that Freja was the very first one to have an invisibility cloak, because for all the shenanigans that I, as a small child, got myself into, nobody saw me. I just was not visible. So I must have had an invisibility cloak over me. It's the only reason I can think of that I'm sitting here speaking with you. October 1942, the liquidation of the Pietrakov ghetto. Tell us, Frasia. Yes, that's been very, very highly documented. October, I think it was from the 14th, it was a seven day period where the, the trains departed from the Pietrakov, from the city of Pietrakov, from the town square, the, Citizens were rounded up every single day for that entire week, and the cattle cars were filled every single day. I didn't know that then, but as the names were called out on a daily basis, when the quota was filled and the cars were filled, they departed, and then the next day, the same story. And that final destination for the people there was Treblinka and it was a one-way trip. My mother and my baby brother were one of those days. They, my grandparents, my aunts, just almost the entire family, the only ones that did not uh, did not go on those transports during that week was one of my mother's sisters and a brother and me. And Freja, how did you escape the trains? Well, I don't, I don't know how I escaped it. I, things happen. I was, I was Freja and when we apparently had to stand at attention or stand in that square for hours and hours on a daily basis. There wasn't any way that Freja was just going to do that. And so being close to the ground, I walked, I just wandered around. I wove my way. I remember weaving my way through legs, looking for things to play with. There were probably 
some mice or some rats or some animals that I befriended that I just had to take care of. After all, they needed me. And it wasn't until I heard Paula Geltzmann. I heard it. I heard it being called that. Well, that's Mama. And so I wherever I was with this multitude of people in this town square, working my way again through their feet to run, to be. I, if, if my mother was, her name was called, I needed to be there. She was holding my baby brother. <sighs> Rabbi, I don't, I, I, I can't even, you know, when I think about uh, strength, I, mean, I think about courage. And I think to myself, I saw the back of my mother as she was, she was holding Shimek, and I could see him looking over her shoulder. It was far, it was a distance, and I'm running through, and I'm yelling, I am screaming, Mama. And by the way, that is the last time I have ever been able to use the word Mama. It just, that was it. And I remember being, as I was trying to push through the crowd, through the feet, I was grabbed. And someone put a hand over my mouth and just shoved me to the ground. I wasn't, I wasn't very high off the ground. It was my Aunt Gucha, my mother's sister. And she kept me down. And then I stayed with her until she was sent off to a labor camp. And then I was with my Uncle Bernard, my mother's brother, who was also doing slave labor in the, the ghetto in Piotrka, until he was transported. And then I was passed on to whatever distant relative by marriage still happened to be in the ghetto until the final liquidation in the, toward the end of 1944. But to go back to, to my mother, I, I recently wrote uh, an essay, uh, a paper, and I was trying to describe uh, strength and courage. And I was, I was really trying to think, how do you describe a mother who is walking purposely, she has no choice, toward the, the trains, toward the cars, and hears her child calling and does, has the strength, has the courage, has the fortitude to not turn around, to not acknowledge her child, knowing that if she did, that child would be joining her on whatever journey. She did not know where her journey was leading, but she did know that she didn't want me there. And what I think about that is just, who, who can do that? Who? That's...